Welcome back to the Queen City. The Cincinnati Zoo is known for its gardens, breeding programs, and pulling you back in time with its well-preserved history. But today I'm going to be showing you its progress going forward with this. Africa. Now that's a broad term, but it represents life on the grasslands, drylands, and rivers. All of this was planned way back in 2003. First I heard of it was in 2009 during a volunteer orientation. Giraffes were already over here, but no one really expected that four more phases would follow. We'll meet the animals that became city icons, get choked up from a heartwarming story that inspired the world, and at the end, I'll show you what Africa almost looked like. I wouldn't exactly call it notable for its immersion, but I will say it's a different take on the African concept not based on its animals, but its design. The true entrance is placed in the middle. That's just more backtracking. So we'll go to the very far right to phase number one. Added in 2008, the Giraffe Bridge. The thing that started it all. A single nearly 30,000 square foot field that gives these animals a great look over the rest of the area you'll find the Maasai Giraffe. Before Africa, a single giraffe was exhibited near the elephants, but the ridge opened with several and eventually spawned a baby boom. Since 2011, seven calves have been born here, some within just weeks of each other. Believe it or not, Cincinnati was the first place in the country to breed them way back in 1889. Your main view is an observation deck with essentially nothing stopping the animals from coming right up to you. Not only does this allow you to get eye level with them, but of course you can feed them at certain times, and over here you can get a clear look at their indoor stalls. And it's not every day you get to see something like this. The best time to look in here is during the winter's festival of lights when it's dark out. Probably the best thing about this exhibit is the campsite in the back, where families can actually stay overnight and awake to a giraffe's footsteps and possibly a lion's roar. To the left of the deck next door, a small simple marsh that blends in perfectly with the display in the background. The foreground is home to a chattery flamboyance of greater flamingos, the zoo's secondary flamingo area. The other being in the Rhino Reserve, which by the way always looks a little gray this time of the year. But back here, this continued Africa's expansion as part of 2010's Phase 2. In between these guys and the next is a ground level look at their savanna giants. And straight ahead, part of the second phase as a renovation is a one-way path that stops at the Cheetah Encounter. A 335 foot long presentation yard where the fastest terrestrial animal can demonstrate their speed. But these cats are not alone, as currently or in the past, the show included a porcupine, a serval, a Red River hog named Sir Francis Bacon, and their puppy companions. Now going back, across from the giraffes, phase number three. The original concept reveals this was meant for cheetahs. Fortunately, pride took its place. Arriving in 2013, Amani of St. Louis and John of DC, two of some of the most impressive lions you'll ever lay your eyes on. They came together thanks to an AZA breeding recommendation, and in just over a year, they became parents to three girls. The zoo's first litter of lions born since Siegfried and Roy's in 2001. John and Amani are alone once more and can be viewed from this tall viewing shelter or from this open spot. They're enclosed in heavy brush, rock in a very low wall, easily escapable if not for the water. And the open concept allows the king and queen of this queen city to sit on pride rock and get a good look over their territory, which is phase four, otherwise labeled as the African Plains, at 35,000 square feet, it is the largest sanctuary in the park. The viewing runs down the entire length of the field. It's complemented by a busy watering hole that falls right into the lion's den, therefore framing a positively concerning predator and prey illusion. This mixing here is either all female, all male, or related, so there's no unauthorized breeding on the savannah. 
The planes were open to roam in 2014, truly being the project that made Africa's flow come together. But it only started off with three animals. Today that number is now at 11. First, the birds. The Kenyan Crested Guinea Fowl, a two-pound polka-dotted social bird that flocks in groups of 20. There's Bubba, the Rupel's Griffin Vulture, one of the savannah's three original inhabitants. His kind is considered to be the highest flying bird in the world, confirmed to be at 37,000 feet in the air. Later, Bubba was joined by two similar cousins, the larger Lappet-faced vulture, considered to be the most powerful and aggressive of the African vultures. But these three do get along very well and are often seen together. Bubba did spend a lot of his time on this island, but it's now mostly taken over by the pink-backed pelican. Widely dispersed throughout the continent's sub-Saharan regions, preferring lakes and lagoons as you can see here. What you're looking at right now is their way of cooling off. They open their beak and vibrate their throats, which is their own way of panting. Being gray and white, they don't entirely live up to their name, but their bellies, back, and beaks do form a pink hue as they mature. They are another original inhabitant of the plains, except they did come from the zoo's own jungle trails. There's also generally displayed but still endangered gray crowned cranes, and also coming from the jungle trails is a saddle-billed stork. At five feet, they are the tallest of their kind in the world. That may be the case, but no one in here quite squares up to ostriches Pam and Rose, the last of the Savannah's three original occupants. Now to the mammals, starting with Walter the hand-raised warthog, coming to the zoo from Dallas when he was 11 weeks old, and then was the last to be added to Africa. Sadly, he passed away last December, and it's an understatement to say that he will be missed by the city. Additionally, the plains has Thompson's gazelles, the most common gazelle in East Africa, and it wouldn't surprise me if that fact applied to zoos as well. There's also Impala, another well-populated antelope that can leap a distance of 33 feet and 10 feet in the air in just one jump. Then there's Hobbs, the lesser kudu and also from St. Louis. He spends quite a bit of his time pestering Mike, the white bearded wildebeest, also known as the big man on campus. However, you may notice that he's actually smaller than usual. Wildebeest was listed on the original plan, but he did not come to the zoo until 2017. The only thing missing are the zebras, which almost had their own area in the back. As you can see, that would not be ideal. While this savanna is on the smaller side, at least it's large in diversity. Now continuing phase four, the Painted Dog Valley. Lush, shaded with birch trees, and a stream that runs through the middle, connecting and falling into pools on either side. Easily, in my opinion, the zoo's most well-assembled design, but it is the greenest. Underneath is a 400,000 gallon detention tank that collects rainwater and keeps it out of the sewers. It's filtered and then reused throughout the entirety of this Africa section, giving you the opportunity to see a wild puppy pool party. The painted dog is one of the most endangered and therefore one of the rarest animals in Africa, having only around a population of 5,000. The zoo started off with two, the first time we had these dogs since the mid-2000s. Since 2015, again believe it or not, 32 pups have called Cincinnati home, 22 coming from one mother, and 10 adopted from the endangered wolf center in Missouri. And though it may be greedy to ask, hopefully they'll one day be adding more. Opening with the dogs, an open top, dry shrubland. First home to bat-eared foxes, now home to a mob of meerkats. A South African mongoose that are experts at digging and creating tunnel systems underground. They're also good at comedic relief and of course being a crowd favorite to children. These may live in the smallest space of this Africa, but for their size, it's actually pretty large. And you can see them from just about every angle, so we will run into them once again. Next, an area so popular that sometimes it has its own line. We've met some local celebrities. Now, we get to see world celebrities. 
Welcome to The Hippo Cove, the last addition to this eight year long project. Almost identical to St. Louis's Hippo Harbor, this nearly looked like the one in Bush Gardens because hippos and crocodiles were side by side on the original concept. The cove's viewing is 65 feet long, has a 70,000 gallon pool, cost seven and a half million dollars, and opened in 2016, which marked the hippos' return to Cincinnati since the mid 90s. It started with female BB, coincidentally from St. Louis, and male Henry of the Dickerson Park Zoo. Being a bit up there in age, he passed a year later, but did leave a legacy with six calves, including Princess Fiona, the most famous animal in the world, at least at one point. Famous because she's known as the little hippo that could. If you haven't heard her story, which I know you have, but why not hear it again? On January 24th, 2017, Phoebe prematurely gave birth to a girl that weighed only 29 pounds when she should have weighed at least twice that number. Immediately, the staff stepped in and cared for her around the clock, rehabilitating her to a healthy weight, making her an expert swimmer, and eventually successfully reuniting her with her family. In that span, quickly she became a symbol of hope, inspiring others who struggle to fight like Fiona. If you couldn't tell, she has a massive fandom of all ages, and just seeing her gives you bragging rights. And I'm not exaggerating when I say that Fiona is our own little Sebastian. Even just the slightest bit of movement from her causes people to rightfully go wild. Throughout the day, you'll find her soaking up the attention, occasionally painting, cuddling up with, riding on, and giving her mother a playful, tough time. If you ever hear someone say she's just another hippo, which I have, they are wrong. This once underweight preemie that had little chance to live is now at a healthy weight of 1,400 pounds. The path then backtracks you towards the entrance, but first you're offered a peek into the Meerkat's indoor home, one last look at their outdoor space, and your kid's chance to burrow into the bubble. The backtracking continues until you're all the way to the waterhole side of the savannah. And to the right is the formal entrance. Another product of phase three, this is the spot for their off-stage cheetahs. More specifically, right now you might run into red, another premature animal of Africa with a will to survive. Since cheetahs were almost where the lions are, the original arrangement says this was almost a walk through aviary, closely followed by baboons. Now finally, our last stop worth showing is the Base Camp Cafe. Again, part of phase three and officially called the greenest restaurant in America. Personally, one of my favorites, not just because of the food, but because the deck offers a panoramic view of the zoo's greatest design to date. What started off as a simple parking lot ended as what will most likely be the best it has to offer for a very long time. Yes, we may have hit its peak, but with 23 other areas to choose from, you should expect to see a lot more exciting things from our trip around the Cincinnati Zoo. Obviously, you just saw the finished piece, and I promised to show what Africa almost was. Thank you for watching.